a lot of people who like the idea of choral conversations. I think specifically we are, in our conversations, particularly interested in issues of choral culture um, and matters that arise out of research. We're probably at this stage a little less interested in what piece should I get my choir to sing or how do I do a cutoff with my left hand or something just like that. And of course, the presentation today is done by our good friend Shah. Uh, if you don't know Shah, I'm sure you can go and check his biography in many different places. Um, I've known him for many, many years from the days when he was a student at the University of Queensland. He's done some study in Canada. He's got a PhD from his hometown in Singapore. And we're delighted that he is with us. We're looking forward to you joining us then in, um, on the 8th of July, which is not very far away now, um, when we will actually be having the second of our Choral Conversations, which is actually going to be taken by Zachariah Go. And then the one that will follow that is being taken by Rob Davidson from UQ. So we have diversity already lined up. Please tell all your friends about Choral Conversations because we want to grow this as a platform of really serious and wonderful interaction into choral music, choral music culture and choral music research. That, that is enough from me, and so we're handing over right at the start to the man of the moment. Thanks, Shah. Okay. Um, good morning to everyone who is in Singapore, and um, good afternoon to those who are in Australia. Uh, so, without further ado, today I'm going to be talking about the autonomous knowledge within choral music, and this idea of autonomous knowledge and how it could be applied in perhaps using it as a framework to think about the ways in which we have been doing things. So, um, you know, it's quite serendipitous, serendipitous because I like to start this, this whole seminar series with a conversation that I've had with a good friend of mine, and her name is Akiko Otao. So, you know, Akiko and I, have, you know, we've, we've known each other for, for quite a number of years, and Akiko is, uh, you know, she's a lovely soprano, and she's been uh, a voice teacher and a vocal coach in many of the uh, institutions of higher learning in Singapore. So the, the things that we usually talk about when we, we meet up for coffee, you know, we'll talk about this idea of how the students are actually coping with the types of repertoire that the, the, the schools do, the choirs do. And one of the things that, you know, it's that's kind of close to both our hearts is about the idea of healthy vocal production. So when we when we talk about this idea of vocal production, we were talking about, you know, it, it, there's, there's a meta that comes out of these conversations and the two questions can come up. What is the idea of the ideal sound? And how can we produce sound in a healthful manner? But as our conversations uh, went on, we kind of realized too that th there's this very strange idea and fixation with regard to what ideal sounds should be. And then, it, which led me to this question about, you know, how do we actually come to this idea of what the ideal sound come? You know, where is it from? How do we actually kind of uh, come to the conclusion that this is ideal? One of the things that I thought was, is very good and very powerful is the thing that she, she shared with me, which kind of stuck with me a, and I share this with you. What frustrates me is that many people are fixated with producing a sound that their bodies aren't built to produce, rather than falling in love with their uniqueness. Now, an ex extension to this is about how choral conductors, especially in Singapore, have an idea of this beautiful choral sound that is not exactly indigenous to, where, to, to Singapore. They are enamored with this idea of this beautiful British cathedral sound, this beautiful Nordic sounds. And you know, it lets me to the question, you know, how do we how do you even get there? Why is it that we in Singapore have this idea of, of beauty, of aesthetics that's not even you know, that's not local here? So, you know, in pursuing that particular trajectory of thought, one of the things that I thought would be good is to really think about how these ideas are actually produced in Singapore. And I, you know, in part, I have sus suspected that this idea is basically reproduced hegemonically. And by hegemonically, I mean the way in which cultural institutions, schools, uh, even choirs and individuals' personalities have come together to, to, to participate in forming a particular status quo. Now, in, in a way, we do understand, you know, uh, there are cultural institutions in Singapore, especially those that are, you know, uh, that are anchored in schools and institutions of higher learning, that you know, in many ways gatekeep and broker cultural production. And in part because of our history of being you know, a, 
in you know where we, we were uh, colonial space you know we were part of the british empire and a lot of our education our leadership actually come from institutions of the united kingdom a lot of our scholars our leaders were trained in in uk and that also includes our music scholars as well now the other part of that is about it's not just about an enactment from the top but it's about how the citizens of uh, think about our everyday practices our everyday cultural practices you know in singapore basically almost every other person has a piano and almost every other student will actually go for the piano exams and all this all these uh, abrsm grades the trinity grades and all these things they don't do it for the sake of pursuing culture and the arts they do it because it's actually a strategic thing for them to do and the fact that they use this these to kind of build um to to take this accreditation in so much as because it's going to be convenient for them to participate in the great games of education about being able to access programs to access better schools so you know in part one of the things that you know um we have when I say we, I mean in Singaporeans, we have kind of like uh, orientated the expertise towards the, the global north. And because of the idea of the technicism and academic dependency that we have, aka we sending scholars overseas, especially to institutions, you know, I mean, I myself, you know, well, I mean, even though Australia is not exactly north north, but it's also part of the global north, um, you know, we, we, we find expertise elsewhere. It's always outside and it's always pointing towards the west. And you know what, what what we have done is we've we've engaged ourselves in the idea of academic dependency, whereby we cannot produce knowledge on our own; it must be from somewhere else. And therefore, unwittingly, we have subjected ourselves to become subjects of cultural imperialism. So, speaking of cultural imperialism, and you know, so this particular uh, website has gone through the rounds in Singapore. Then best choirs in the world. Now, if you know Singaporeans, uh, uh, or you know, if you like to know about Singapore, we are very competitive, very, very, very competitive. And the idea of being the best, you know, kind of burns us. And when we see this, you know, um, we see the top ten best choirs in the world. And then you know, the 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 conversation that I have on social media is like, huh? How come we're not in the top ten? Oh. Oh, okay. They are, of course, they are going to be in the top ten because they have, they have, you know, the 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 cathedral schools. They have all the conservatoires, so on and so forth. But the interesting to me is that the conversations that I've seen and even the the description of the article um, speaks of a subjectivity of a subject of cultural imperialism because it's always situated in oh because they can produce knowledge oh it's because they have been doing this for all this while. And I'm kind of wondering myself as well, what would our own list, what would our own top 10 choirs look like? And, you know, in part, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, uh, these, these choirs, I feel they're quite good too, but you know, wh where, are, where is, for example, um, St. Olaf, the, the St. Olaf choirs, where is St. James? And I'm thinking, you know, where's the Bach Collegium of Japan? Where is you know Victoria Corel? Where is uh, ACJC alumni? And these are Singapore choirs who have gone overseas to compete and dominate. Then again, I kind of realized also in this particular list that we have in our own creation, what sort of repertoire would these choirs be doing? And if we were to map our own top, top ten best choirs, where would the cultural deserts be? And when you think about it, the, the other question that follows up is, when we aspire to be on this list, on our own choirs, how do we then earn our place there? So, you know, in part, this idea of, of ranking, of listing and all that is it, perhaps, you know, it's a Singaporean trait and it's also very, very problematic because it's always vis-a-vis -vis someone else, right? So I'm taking a step back and think about, you know, if we want to think of how do we be good choirs, what do we need to what do we need to kind of like contend and grapple with so we work on two definitions one is the idea of authenticity the authenticity of fidelity to the, to the music that we do which in in the case of robinson mentions that you know it's being true or close to the original source and um the idea of aesthetic choices about decisions on using styles and techniques to showcase a brand or narrative uh and as musicians as choral conductors we make these decisions every day 
in terms of how to interpret what's printed on the page into performance. Now, you know, um, when we kind of take a look at this in the idea of building authenticity, um, it's often construed in idea of very specific Western repertoire. A lot of the repertoire that um, many choirs are kind of frightened to do are, you know, and, and, and this particular um, this this particular euphemism is actually kind of like out of out of phase too, which is the idea of world musics, and a lot of the choirs don't want to do world musics, and you know in kind of exploring the idea of why canon is canon and why certain repertoire is you know seen to be inaccessible, um, I take a look at three different uh, broader theoretical issues. Now, the first theoretical issue is about the idea of perceptions, access, and inequality. And I refer to the works of Anne Swidler. And Swidler talks about this idea of embracing genres that are no longer rooted in the idea of class differences or ethnic differences. She used this, this whole concept of hip hop to say that, you know, at one point of time, hip hop was the genre of the urban poor in, in North America. And then suddenly the, the bourgeoisie, the, the, the rich it came in and adopted it and you know they pumped money into it they made it into an industry and then it became a it became a multi-million dollar sort of modus that moved so far away from where it originally was and you know conversely when we think about this idea of how um in essence hip-hop that used to be symbolic of the urban poor became a mainstream genre in itself um, it kind of like puts the, 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 the challenge towards choral music too. How is it that, you know, it, we, how, can it, uh, how can we make certain repertoires a little more accessible? And the idea of accessibility comes to the idea of having more capital, more access, more resources. That the fact that, you know, if, um, and we take things for granted as well, the, the fact that the access to publishers, access to the music, access to composers, and this is actually, you know, predicated on positions of privilege as well. The more choirs with better resources will actually have better, uh, better connections to, to all these sort of musics. Now, you know, in, in essence, to what the danger of this is what Swidler has said that when we take something away, when we adapt it to our own too, it kind of loses also it's the idea of its original authenticity, that hip hop that used to be symbolic of the urban poor, now no longer is. Now it becomes symbolic of a big industry. Next, we talk about the idea of adaption and appropriation. And in, in this, I kind of refer to the works of De Susan Mello. And De Susan Mello, uh, works, uh, her works actually engages the idea of how curation is often a visible marker for ideological enactments. So she was taking a look at the museums in Macau and how it kind of changed hands from the Portuguese to the, the, the Chinese government. And how, you know, it, in, in essence, the Portuguese wanted to preserve its, uh, its uh, historical footprint within Macau and curated things like um, it, the, the, the artifacts that came out of China uh, because of the revolution, the, the cultural revolution. So preserve things like the Qianlong emperor's um, um, furniture and all these things. And then when uh, this when the, the Chinese government took over, they, they shifted everything around in a way in which while they still have some of these artifacts, the way they curate these artifacts um, kind of changed the, the, the narrative in its entirety as well. That uh, this, this idea of how the, the artifacts are curated can be translated into how in choir at least, the way in which we curate certain forms of repertoire, certain types of repertoire within our, our programming. So, you know, the, how, how we program and how it's performed has, uh, has become a marker and an imprint on how we position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the cultural hierarchy. What I mean by this is, um, if you want to be taken seriously as a choir, and this is a conversation that I've had with some of the more senior. Sorry, um, there's an airplane coming over. Um, I'm just going to pause for a short while because you know it's uh, foolish for me to be contending against a, a jet. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to continue. 
So um, I remember a conversation I had with a very senior uh, choral music practitioner in Singapore, and he said to me, you know, almost almost in a tone of admonishment, if you want to be taken seriously in Singapore, you have to perform this 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 type of songs. You know, it has to be, it has to be loud, it has to be flashy, it has to be you know, it, it has to be worthy of competition. So you know, it kind of begs me to kind of really think about this idea of adaptation and appropriation too, because it's not about being able to uh, tell authentically the stories of of the of the pieces in itself. It's about using it for prestige, using it uh, using it instrumentally to to win competitions. And this idea of adaptation and appropriation kind of like fits into this. You know, if you are not, we are not going to be doing the work to to tell the story authentically, then are we actually adapting it or are we appropriating it? Which kind of brings me to the next point as well, which is the idea of the cancel culture and the shifting goalposts. Now, I refer to Fletcher, who engages the idea of face work when, appro when approaching others to access their cultural materials and or objects. This idea of face work, being able to, you know, to talk about pleasantries, about niceties, you know, to be able to kind of communicate in a way to um, the the word that was used to to use social lubricants. Now, for, no, for for Fletcher, the social lubricants is not just about being nice. The social lubricants is also about doing extensive work to be able to understand where the person's uh, where the person's culture is, uh, is coming from, and to kind of see to allow themselves to to be seen as legitimate. Now, one of the things that I thought you know uh, as another vignette to share, um, I. Uh, Maybe about two or three years ago, there was an incident whereby this particular composer was being called out because this particular composer was using a cultural material that was not from his own uh, ethnicity, and they were saying, "Oh, you know, he shouldn't be doing this. You know, you know, this is inappropriate, and all these things." Um, I felt what was missing in this nuance was the fact that this particular individual actually had spent an extensive amount of time going to this, you know, through this particular space where he had learned the cultural forms. He spent an extraordinary amount of time, you know, under tutelage of a you know, of a senior cultural pr practitioner, and they they continued to maintain a, a, a mentorship and a relationship all this while. So you know, when he was when he presented his work, and then there was a backlash. And you know he was like, oh, you know, you're appropriating and all these things. So this idea of being cancelled was actually quite real to this particular composer. And I say this, you know, um, at, at least for me as a as a as a as a brown person myself, this idea of, of cancel culture is very very problematic because it seeks, as what Audre Lorde would say, you know, to use the master's tool to you know to, to dismantle the master's house. Um, being no, uh, the the fear of being cancelled or the 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 enactment of cancelling in itself uh, is for us very problematic because it stops and inhibits opportunities for us to learn better, to know better, to do better, to get to know uh, uh, you know uh, different cultures and to see how we can take these cultural materials, these these compositions, and perform it uh, to the best of our ability in a form that is most authentic. So. Um, where do we go from here then? Oh no, basically these are just problems, right? Now, um, in parallel to this, I thought what would be good is for us to kind of like understand the, the broad scope of what voice sciences say. And I say this because I want to kind of bring in also an empirical and experimental dimension to the conversation. And of course, you know, there are some, uh, some individuals from certain sectors might feel this might feel very uncomfortable because this speaks of the idea of eugenics and all that, and it basically creates more divisions within humanity. But what you know, the the idea of voice sciences in terms of ex experimentation and all that, um, what what do they show us thus far? And basically, uh, this this particular segment is is uh, findings from a from a broad scan of uh, of of papers that have come out with vo uh, voice sciences itself. Firstly, they say that the the fundamentals of breathing and singing are almost universal, almost universal in so much in so much as because it's dependent on the physiology of the human being, right? And we have certain I mean the 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 structure is universal, but the way in which it's built is not. And this also applies to across genres as well, um, genres and genuses in so much as um, 
you know, uh, if you talk about the idea of like, for example, two one throat singing versus you know singing gospel versus singing in a choir versus singing jazz and all that, certain breathing and 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 fundamentals of singing techniques are universal, but certain genres actually have other higher level techniques that is specific to the genre in itself. Next and most importantly is the physiological differences that we we were trying to account for are as follows. The fact that a constant musculature development or underdevelopment due to language acculturation and singing approaches, which means if you grow up speaking a certain language and all that, there are certain certain muscular systems are actually very well developed and other other muscular systems are not so. Uh, uh, there was a particular muscle. Let me just 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 check this, um, and I want to make sure that I get this 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 correct. Um, obscurus oris, if I'm not mistaken, um, and that's something that in Singapore we don't tend to develop it because of the way we speak our languages. I'm just going to check it one more time so that you know I I get this right. Um, so just give me a second here. Um, yes, obicularis oris. Yes, obicularis oris, which is one of the mu muscle, muscle systems within the uh, within the, uh, uh, the the phonation system. Now, the other thing that I thought would uh, would be good is to actually understand how physical and environmental elements and stresses shape the way in which we sing, we breathe, and we speak. It. So the idea of humidity, tem temperature, and all that. So uh, we have like uh, the 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 studies by Sundarajan and and you as well that talk about how humidity actually affects the way we phonate, the affects the way we actually um, uh, align our formants, so to speak. So you know what, in in a way, the 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 be all and all of this particular thing is, if we want to, if we want to be able to kind of create certain sounds and all that, um, we may not be able to replicate the exact techniques that the, these individuals from different spaces will have. We need to find techniques that will work for us because of our structure, you know, the, the physiological limitations. So, you know, but moving forward, do we really want to just replicate for the sake of replication, right? So, you know, in a way, I would offer an alternative paradigm to, us, to think about authenticity to, to, uh, and, and approaches for repertoire. First of all, is to talk about the idea of interculturalism. A multimodal synthesis using cultural artifacts and materials from different sources to create a dynamic product. And the idea of autonomous knowledge, which is an orientation of localized or indigenous epistemic production. What I mean by this is also about um, the, we, in, at least vis a vis the idea of voice sciences, that the fact that we need to know what the human body is capable of doing from where we are, how it's able to produce sounds that are helpful and all that. This idea of looking and producing knowledge from within, as opposed to taking a template from outside, saying, oh, you know, the, the, the voice teachers say this, blah, 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 and all that. This is the bel canto style, so on and so forth. It is not just a mimesis or a mimicry of the, the techniques itself, but we need to kind of move forward to see how this can be applied. Now the work of, uh, I mean, just to wax lyrical a bit more, this idea of um, autonomous knowledge. Um, it, this idea first kind of mooted out not from the works of Hussein Alatas, uh, who, you know, who is actually a quite prominent scholar, a prominent scholar of uh, uh, post, post colonial studies. But it came outside, as in the next generation, you know, his students and his grand students, to talk about the idea of being able to produce knowledge from without the, the, the hallowed halls of, of um, epistemic production. Uh, and we say this also because when we take a look at canonic works, um, I mean, you know, in, in part, I'm just going to share this. When I'm, uh, there's a course that I'm teaching uh, about the idea of transformation of work. And when I inherited it, I looked at it, the, 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 the course structure, and there were basically the works of four uh, prominent uh, the theorists Aristotle, John Locke, Karl Marx, and Emil Durkheim. And my first question is, okay, that's well and good, but where are the brown scholars? Where are the contemporary scholars? Where are the indigenous and local scholars? And, and for us to be able to kind of stop and, and think and to, to kind of reorientate this and say, hey, okay, uh, there's an absence here. Um, there's a, and I won't, I won't say it's a silence, but you know, because in a sense whereby, at least in this case, the person who knows or who created the work 
I perhaps were, weren't aware of the, the existing scholarship and all that. So, you know, um, and I'm quite happy to actually have an extended conversation about the idea of autonomous knowledge. It is not a way to demonize what is, you know, what, what is already currently canon, but for us to kind of stop and be critical about what's there and how we can include indigenous knowledge, localized knowledge to actually enhance our understanding of the world that we see in especially because the indigenous and localized knowledge is contextualized in the space of which we exist. So when we talk about syntax and strategies of action, um, first of all, you know, uh, this is kind of my favorite conversation piece, understanding syncrasity. I'm sure if you are a choral, you know, choral music enthusiast or a scholar, you have heard about the great Latin divide. Because if you have a piece, um, and then if you sing it in Germany and you know, in Austria, and you sing it in the UK, and you sing it in Rome, and you sing it in Spain, chances are the word M-A-G-N-A -A is going to be something very, very different, right? And then, you know, there'll be this, this whole debate of, no, you should pronounce it this way because the person was you know, German, or the composer was German, and, oh, you know, we should pronounce it this way, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. This idea of syncrasity kind of you know, it's beautifully encapsulated in this particular conversation piece, because a lot of the vowel uh, about uh, the, the vowel shift and the, the constant, constant shift is also predicated on the fact that these individual spaces have practiced the, the ethno-religious um, cultural forms, you know, for, you know, for extended period of time. And the fact that they do it because that it is authentic to themselves. Is something that you know we we should take credence in. So to, an extension to that is you know are we going to be able to really uh, adopt mimesis to be able to perform a piece in its very specific authentic uh, form? I, it, that's going to be quite difficult as well. To understand the idea of syncrasity is also to understand the limitations of what we can do in terms of following the forms and what we uh, what what we have been doing which is singing in a very specific style, you know, being able to speak in a very specific style and all that. And again, I mean, this is not meant to be prescriptive and it's meant to be, you know, in a sense, syncrasity is a continuum. But the next thing that I wanted to talk about is the idea of the social map of representation. Uh, and, you know, it kind of uh, echoes back to the thing that I've asked. When we have a list of our 10 choirs, where are these 10 choirs? And, you know, if you put a map and you put a dot into it and all that, where's the cultural desert? And one of the things that we need to do as, as choral music practitioners is to kind of understand that there's a plurality now, that choral music is not just solely, you know, it's not a, you know, the classical West that actually has choral music. Choral music has actually a vast expense and it has, you know, gone through all, you know, all sorts of shapes, uh, all sorts of forms and towards all sorts of peoples as well. I mean, when we think about, like, for example, Hanak Pachap, you know, this, the, 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 the music of the new world. And the fact that the Hanak Pacha was actually kind of performed and written in a way which in, in, in many ways kind of echoed the idea of what indigenous music was at that point of time. Um, and we have amazing repertoire and amazing music coming out from, you know, from many, many parts of the world. Uh, the African music is, you know, the, the music from South Africa, from, from Lesotho, from all these other spaces, music from Indonesia, from the Philippines. Um, and, you know, each of these spaces actually have very long traditions of choral music. What is it that, what was stopping us from actually accessing the music? What was stopping us from actually kind of performing it? You know, in part, we had an excuse whereby, oh, we didn't have internet at that point of time, or we didn't have access to publishers. Now, a lot of publishing companies are actually kind of doing the work for us in reaching out, in getting, you know, and getting a collection of all these world musics. Earth Song has been leading that for the longest time, but now there are more new, younger publishing spaces. And we should also think about very carefully about how we can kind of engage that, you know, and kind of build a, 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 a wide repertory of, of music to offer to our audiences. Next, I want to talk about the idea of the rhizomatic relationships between the composer, the pieces, and performers. And this is ideas actually coming from the, you know, from a almost a post-colonial, not post, a post-modern post deconstructionist, the Russian deconstructionist. The fact that the composer, the piece, and the performers, they exist in different spaces. That the fact that, you know, when 
uh, compose uh, it writes a piece you know um, and uh, we we try to understand what was the motivations of the composer and all that and the piece you know uh, itself has, a, has a, its own life world uh, and uh, I mean to bring back to the example of you know having a an Ave Verum written you know written by Mozart for example and then um, you know brought to England to be performed at a wedding and you know and it's you know in in a way what we what we will want uh, to to have is this beautiful English sound that may not necessarily be German but and you know the idea of that also that's that should be fine too the idea of rhizomatic relationships is that that it is not hierarchical in nature that the fact that sometimes certain aspects take precedence over others um you know the other the other good example i i love to to, to talk about in the idea of rhizomatic relationships uh, and the, between composer pieces and performers is allegri's miserere um and, and you know that there have been there have been a lot of like scholarly work uh, that talks about this the how the false bodon may actually be exaggerated and the, it shouldn't be high c and all that um and I, in in some ways i appreciate the scholarly work that's been done to that but on a, on a deep personal level i love that high c and you know have to for me to have an opportunity to perform it i would rather perform the piece that has the high c and rather than the piece that is meant to be more authentic and to me, you know, I, I make that choice simply because, you know, uh, my relationship, you know, as a performer to the piece is um, the, the high C has beautiful connotation and meaning to, to us, the epitome of what I feel is beauty, right? Next, and not least, is the idea of scaffolding audiences' experiences. And to me, this is also very, very important too, because we don't seek to perform choral music for the sake of just performing choral music. The performance itself has different functions within society i mean you know for some of us perform you know for, ch for church services some of us perform in concert halls some of some of us perform to you know a group of of, uh, of patients with dementia and all that this idea which is kind of articulated by people like here denora about how the the functionality of music um is predicated on who the music um who receives the music right um and in part, we should use this opportunity, not just performance for the sake of performance, but performance also to educate, to enthuse, to enlighten. Um, I'm not, you know, this is, it, it sounds almost a bit like F.R. Levis in, in how, you know, culture is a civilizing force and all that. But to me, choral music, because it sits in a whole tapestry of, of different cultures and different forms, you know, it allows us to kind of present snippets of the world to the audiences. So, you know, in, in part, these syntax and strategies are not meant to be prescriptive. It's meant, you know, as a way for us to really rethink about how these, you know, our, our the ways in which we, we make meaning and we make decisions of choosing repertoire, choosing the performance, choosing how to engage the audiences. Uh, in part, we need to do the work, as I've mentioned earlier, to be able to expand understanding not just for ourselves but for the audiences as well so um i would like to end off with this there are no rules or prescribed guidebooks and this is in part in the philosophy of the autonomous knowledge that you know there, there shouldn't be a you know we shouldn't be so beholden to a canon whereby you know it is dis disjunct from reality but we need to see it as a journey for consensus and deeper understanding of what our shared relationship to music and to one another is all about yeah, for that, with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. But uh, ahead of that, I'm actually going to suggest to or to thank Shah again. Thank you all for being participants. And please, we look forward to you registering for uh, July the 8th. It is a Friday. You will find that our choral conversations are either on a Tuesday or a Friday, as what suits the presenter. And the pres presenter is Zachariah Go, who you've actually seen and heard speak in the session today. And we look forward to registering and seeing you there. Thank you very much, everybody. And we hope you actually have a lovely time making choral music, singing in choral music, listening to choral music until we meet again. So long. Mm -hmm.